Um, I'll propose to uh, speak for, for about 40 minutes and I'll be relying on someone to just give me a signal when I've reached that uh, stage. And what I'd like to do is to um, talk about the background to my prose writing uh, rather than the poetry, which has been another, an, another track of mine over the years. And in the process, I think, well, at least I hope, I'll touch on some of the issues that have been raised by Porrick Fogarty in his uh, talk just, um, just now. And if I, if I might begin with uh, uh, Robert Lloyd Prager, and there you have a slide of the book I published in 1998 uh, on, on his life. And if I, if I can just make a slightly academic point uh, to begin with, we talk in this country about environmental damage and uh, degradation and all of the rest of it. And sometimes we look at other cultures and we talk about, you know, what's going on in Scotland or what, what the Dutch are doing or what, you know, what's happening in parts of France. And sometimes we feel a certain envy. It seems at times that um, culturally there is a different view of biodiversity and the landscape. Uh, now I'll qualify that, that it's not all plain sailing, of course, but I think we are aware that as well as the, the economic drivers of environmental change, there are, there are also cultural factors at play. And why does Prager matter in this context? Well, if we take the period that we're familiar with in this country, uh, which we refer to as the Irish Literary Renaissance or the Gaelic Revival, um, we, we're familiar with a number of names like Douglas Hyde, uh, Lady Gregory, uh, John Millington Singh, W.B. Yeats, and so on, as culture givers, as the people who defined uh, culturally the nation that we feel we, we belong to today. But as I did the, the work on Prager, I was conscious of the need to add his name to the list of culture givers of that same period. And incidentally, his dates are quite similar to Yeats. He was born the same year as Yeats in 1865 and lived, well, lived until 1953. And there are some significant parallels between Prager's career and the career of people like Hyde and Yeats and Singh. As we track that feeling of excitement, of discovery, of the island and its heritage. We're familiar with the story from language, from folklore, and so on, but I think natural history and heritage deserve to be added to that uh, overall pattern. So there's a picture of uh, Prager and his wife uh, Hedwig, probably taken just after the, the turn of the century. And he was, uh, just to tell you briefly, he was from County Down originally. The name is uh, of Dutch origin. He moved to Dublin in, the, in 1892, 93, and was, a, was involved in the establishment of a journal called The Irish Naturalist, a monthly magazine of Irish natural history. And if you look at the image there, you'll see the uh, antlers of the great Irish deer. You see uh, the St. Patrick's cabbage saxifrage there on the bottom uh, just to the left. And somewhere on that picture as well, there is a, a Kerry spotted slug uh, crawling up the side of the, of the image. Uh, um, yeah, I can't, I can't for the moment see him. Oh, he's across the bottom. He's moving there across the bottom, uh, heading towards the right hand uh, corner. And with the you know, with the old Irish characters of the title as well, you get the sense here that this is natural history, but it is natural history with an Irish flavour. So the, there is a sense here that um, Irish identity is also about the, uh, natural, the natural heritage. Now, Prego was um, many things. He worked as a librarian th throughout his life. But he was a great amateur organizer of 
uh, field clubs and field club unions. So he started with the Belfast Naturalist Field Club, then he became involved in the Dublin Naturalist Field Club, and he decided at one point that he would bring them all together into an Irish field club union and they would go for annual, well, triennial outing. So every three years they'd all gather together and go somewhere. And they went to the most memorable of the joint outings was to, was to the Aran Islands and uh, the Burren. And at the end of the, the, the several days going around visiting the Burren, the Aran Islands, the, the karst landscape, they produced a, a kind of expanded version of the Irish naturalist where they detailed the different plant and animal groups for these islands. And that idea of a systematic list of species within the different categories became the germ of the Clare Island Survey. Now it had a, a second iteration as the Lambe Survey in 1907 when similarly they went to an island, they studied all of the different plant and animal groups using specialists and they, dis they discovered things that were new to science uh, at the time. So that formula then became expanded as the Clare Island Survey. And there's an image uh, from Clare Island of some of the scientists who went out to the island to, to list, to identify species in the different uh, categories. So you had someone who specialised in birds, someone on mollusks, someone on flowering plants, another one, uh, the great Roland Southern, uh, was a great specialist in marine life. He deserves, I think, special mention, although he worked in rather obscure categories. So that also gives you just a flavour of the social background. These Victorian gentlemen, um, the ladies don't really come into the picture very often, uh, other than making tea and providing catering arrangements. And without being glib about it, there are some uh, remarkable um, instances of um, women careers in, in, in botany and in, in illustration. Although it has to be said, many of the careers in illustration were subservient to the men who were uh, publishing the learned papers and, and books. <clears throat> so that is um, just um, a few things about Robert Light Prager who interested me because of his um, his position during the time of the Gaelic revival or the Irish literary renaissance when Irish natural history became established as an aspect of, of our cultural heritage, if you like. Now, there were all sorts of reasons why after the revolution and into the period of independence, natural history kind of took a back seat a lot of these people were from what you might call broadly the um, you know, pr Protestant society, um, Anglo-leaning Irish society, and there was obviously a kind of dispersal after independence. And as we know, the great cultural agenda of the independent state from the 20s onwards was, had to do with language and folklore, and indeed religion as well. And as we've noted from Porrick's uh, account of you know, legislation from the middle of the 20th century, we don't really see any concern with, uh, with natural history, with the natural history legacy in the legislation that applied to the exploitation of Ireland's natural resources. So just um, moving on then to my own interests as a, as a writer, um, I, I'd like to talk specifically about uh, something that interested me was uh, the fate of Ireland's uh, eagles. And this was an interest that it was, I think, captured for me really when I went to Norway uh, with my brother, Liam. Some of you may know him as the director of the National Biodiversity Data Centre, and he was involved in the scientific work to identify 
sites that might be suitable for the reintroduction of the golden eagle. We know that eventually the eagles were reintroduced in Donegal, but the Erif Dulac area of um, Mayo was also a, a candidate. But it, anyway, it, it went to Donegal in the end. And through his scientific contacts, uh, Liam was invited to Norway, and I, my wife and I went along with him. And we went to a place near Trondheim to a natural uh, to a natural reserve and on one occasion one morning I stepped out of the the house and looked up and I saw a pair of sea eagles crossing the sky and it was an extraordinary sight uh, to see such a thing in in Europe and I realized as well there was the thought in the back of my mind that this is a sight that would have been possible in parts of the west of Ireland uh, up to the turn of the century up to around 1900. So my curiosity then led me to go back to the old topographical books and to see what people had written about eagles in Mayo in particular. And I published a little um, academic paper in an obscure book about the record of eagles in, in this county. And it was just a desk exercise, looking through the old uh, topographical authors. And then Lorcan O'Toole, who's uh, been involved with Golden Eagle, Golden Eagles in Donegal for many years, said to me, have you been to these places? Have you visited all these sites? And I said, no, no. But then the idea sort of lodged in my, in my mind, and um, something happened a bit later that led me to um, actually to do that. I'm sort of, I'm starting at the, at the end, if you like. Th that's the book that I published in uh, 2018 on my travels, my explorations, looking at the history of eagles, mostly in Mayo, but also in a few other places. And also, crucially, not just eagles in the past, but eagles now, since the two reintroduction programs, first in Donegal with the Golden Eagle, following... Uh, followed by the Sea Eagle reintroduction uh, in Killarney, mainly. So this, uh, this is just to give you an impression of my way of working. One winter, I was decided to explore the, the, the roads, the little boreens uh, around where I live, about five kilometres northeast of Westport. And you see there the map, it's an Ordnance Survey map, photocopied, where I marked in pink the little roads that I walked. And after several walks like this, I think I began to uh, sort of exhaust the novelty of these, these little roads through, through farmland. And next thing anyway, one of the old eagle place names that I had put into the academic article began to tantalise and tempt me. And that was a place called Drum Ilra, or Eagle Ridge. And you can see it there, inked in, um, just under the sort of the lopsided box, the lopsided pink box in the centre of the, the image. Uh, any of you uh, from, fr from this area, or any of you who know um, Newport Westport, you, you'll have gone to Derinumera with your uh, recycling, your bottles and uh, cardboard for recycling. Well, Dromilra is a ridge just behind uh, Derinumera. Now, there's nothing very dramatic about it. It's, it's a fairly low whaleback ridge, but clearly in the past it was a place where eagles stopped maybe to, to preen or to strip a carcass uh, or whatever. So that, that I was kind of tempted beyond my normal range to, to go to uh, Dromilra. And that was the beginning then of my, my sort of, my campaign. That gave me the way of working. So I decided that I would take up uh, the hint given by Larkin O'Toole and try to visit the places that were mentioned by the old writers in connection with uh, sea eagles and, and golden eagles. And I'd, I'd like to emphasize just at this point how, 
how amateur this, this exercise was. Um, I sketched little odds and ends, little, um, you could see the back of Clare Island there on the bot bottom left. Bottom right, there's, um, uh, that's on the Koran Peninsula from, from the, the, the interior, if you like, where I noticed that there was a, uh, a big slab of sandstone over, um, lying over the old metamorphic rock. It was just a, a rather amateur general curiosity about a place without any great you know, technical ability, N not, not as, uh, as a scientist, not as, um, not as someone who had elaborate um, gadgets mapping the route, not nothing. Nothing like that. Just a curiosity that um, took me to these places and in a few instances uh, led me to try to sketch in a bit of detail a place that was associated with, with eagles in the past. And that, that's a, a ledge of rock overlooking the car park at Letterkeen, which some of you may know as one of the entrances to the Wild Nathan National Park, uh, where uh, it's a place called Carre Gunnullar, the Eagle Rock, and I was trying to decide if, if that indeed was the place where the eagles might have nested once upon a time. So it was a, a series of walks that took me to places I'd never been to, many of them. Many of it, much of it was new to me. And along the way, of course, you meet people, uh, you get distracted, uh, you end up getting interested in something that has nothing to do, to do with your main um, task. On the North Mayo coast, which is a particularly rich uh, eagle heritage, we met a man called um, Peter Burke, who insisted on showing us around his, his area, including a place called Horse Island, which is almost a sea stack just off the uh, North Mayo coast, not far from Beldarig or, or Cajun. And so we, we went out onto Horse Island and uh, Peter was telling us about how, as a lad, he would explore the area and how they used to um, jump this gap in the, in the rock. And I was very fortunate. I think I, I clicked twice. And on the second click, I managed to capture Peter in the, in the moment of, of jumping the, the gap there. So I, I include that here um, just, I think, to point out how when we're talking about landscape, we're also talking about the people. And they have their own quality of pride, their own quality of belonging. And I have rarely met uh, sheep farmers who have expressed hostility to, uh, to eagles. Um, rarely. I, but I have met such, a, such people. But more, more typically, I've met men who've been very interested in this whole business of rewilding and the return of eagles to the, uh, to the landscape. Um, so I think when we're talking about agriculture in this sense of policy and so on, we're talking about a, very often a, a group of people who, whose practices are, are influenced by policy makers and advisors telling them that this is the way they should be doing things or this is what they must do if they're going to get, get their, their money. And I think if the policies changed, then the practice uh, could, could change as well. So I'm saying here really, um, I met a lot of really fine people uh, along the, the way, and if they were hostile to eagles, if any of them were hostile to eagles, um, they, they certainly didn't uh, express it to me. And this then was the map that um, a friend compiled as a result of, the, of my explorations. Now, it, it is a map that it's somewhat dated. Uh, there are a couple of things that I would change if I was doing it today. Uh, if we just take the example of Ackle, which I suppose um, is of particular interest to us uh, today, you will see there I have listed sea, sea eagle uh, iris as S, 
S1, S2, and so on, and golden eagle iris as G1, G2, and so on. And without going into the detail, um, just to say broadly that of the two species, the sea eagle was clearly the more abundant in, uh, in the past. It, it was clearly the eagle species of the North Mayo coast, and there were several uh, traditional sites there. There were also three or four territories on Ackle, and there were a couple of territories down on the Erif uh, Duloc area. And some of them then are, it's questionable whether the eagles at these sites were sea eagles or um, golden eagles. For instance, G9 there in the middle of the map, just over the Wild Nafa National Park, I've marked it as a golden eagle site, but in my thinking now, I would be more inclined to argue that it was, a, in fact, a sea eagle site, although, although it was quite a distance from the coast. In terms of numbers, I've been asked this question, and it's just a guesstimate, really. I would say that there might have been 12 pairs of sea eagles in the county. Uh, this is before persecution, and perhaps half that number of golden eagles. The reason why each of the, um, the, th the three sites on Ackle have been labelled both sea eagle and golden eagle is because it's clear that um, sea eagles were exterminated on Ackle at a certain point and then the golden eagles move, it, move in. This is one of the revisions that I, should have, I, should be, I would make now to this map if given the opportunity. There is a reference in William Thompson's Natural History of Ireland to uh, someone who was stationed on Ackle in the early 19th century who reckoned that there were four sea eagle uh, territories here. So that will give you an indication of the, the, we might say nowadays, the carrying capacity of, of Ackle. And as we're here now in Dugart, just above us, um, we have one of the best documented sea eagle iris in the county. The, the nest site at Schlieve Moor was described by W.H. Maxwell in his book Wild Sports of the West from sometime in the 1810s. And it's possible actually to identify precisely the ledge uh, on the cliff on your way up to uh, the top of Schlieve Moor, where the sea eagles uh, nested. Maxwell describes a sheer portion of cliff where the ground was littered with uh, the remains of, of hares and uh, domestic fowl and fish. And some years ago with the Irish mountaineering people, we went for a walk up there and a raven flew into the same cliff into a, a hole. So I was able to make a very precise connection uh, between that site and the historical uh, account. Okay. You, you'll see there, there is a um, sort of, there, there are two elements to this. You've got the place names and you've got the, the, the eagle nesting sites. It's not always easy to, to decide if a place name referring to eagles also refers to a nest site. Uh, in, in some cases, clearly not. If you look right to the foot of the, the map there, there's a place called Creganilra. That's on Kilry Harbour, and it's, it's a sort of low domed hill that gives a good view of the fjord. And clearly it wasn't a place where sea eagles nested, but it would have been ideal for the birds just to stop and have a look around and perhaps uh, strip uh, a hare carcass or a grouse or whatever. <clears throat> okay, I'd, I'd like to have the opportunity to read, just to dip into the book Eagle Country, uh, to give you an impression of how this wasn't just about the past. I always find it a little bit sad when we're talking about the past only. Um, and I'll I'd prefer to offer you just a little impression of seeing uh, golden eagles at an eyrie in Donegal. 
Uh, for obvious reasons, I can't be absolutely precise as to where this was, but it's um, in the county and it describes a territorial pair that were nesting. And this is in June in 20, 2016. And if you'll allow me, I'll just read. Um, I'll read for a, for a minute or two from the account of um, what I call in this book uh, the Donegal epilogue. Um, I'm reading for the entry for, for June the 2nd, but I had actually first seen them the previous day. So I'm, I'm back now on day two to, for another afternoon's watching. I chose a cluster of peat hags for my position today, a little farther back than the site of yesterday's vigil. I was very cautious about disturbance. With the telescope, I took a look at the nest and could just make out a small shape above the nest rim, which I took to be the chick on which so many hopes depended. There was no sign of the adults. If they were on a rock somewhere, they might have been waiting to watch me and judge my intentions. In mid-afternoon, an eagle appeared above the ridge to the left of the eyrie, moving east, away from the nest site. It landed on the same broad sloping crag as yesterday, just out of sight. As if disturbed by the bird's arrival, a group of red deer, including a small calf, appeared on the skyline, moving downhill from that point. One of the deer paused for a moment in profile on another prominent platform of rock just below the eagle's position. When the deer had dropped down on the far side of the ridge out of my view, I saw the eagle again heading back towards the eyrie. It stopped on a rock high on the slope just under the ridge line. I caught sight of it again at half past four going back along the same route to my left. This time it did not stop on the ridge but continued until I lost it as a speck disappearing over the horizon. I waited for another hour in the calm of the uplands. There were times when the thin note of a plover was the only bird sound. Then I heard a hooded crow in the distance behind me. Could its call be alarm at an eagle's appearance? When a sheep bleated on the far side of the lake, I reached for binoculars and discovered several animals grazing the slopes west of the eyrie, the first I had noticed in that place. At 5.20, Goldie came back from the left and at first flew quite low across the quarry in a diagonal line. Then she turned outwards, her wings slightly upturned to catch the updraft, and in no time she was soaring overhead. Once she had gained enough height, she glided away to the right and was lost in the distance. I sensed that this bird was hunting. I continued my vigil and was rewarded at ten past six by the call of a hooded crow at my back. There was Goldie being mobbed by the crow, which then retreated. She soared overhead quite close to me, turning a few times to take a look. I got a view of her wing tag and noticed paler patches at the base of her primaries. She drifted off to the eastern ridge to do a few shutwing dives, possibly a sign that she was not made anxious by my presence and was just advertising her possession of this territory. Eventually she crossed the mountain high above the eyrie and faded away again to the west. A teal tinkled on the far side of the glen. By seven o'clock I decided it was time to leave although I felt reluctant to leave Goldie to her patrols on these vast ranges. My step across the bog was lighter, my energies having recovered after the hours sitting or lying. I looked back a few times as the cliff face sank down under the horizon that I had crossed and scanned the sky for a last glimpse, but the bowl of blue was empty. I flushed a grouse from a peaty wet trench where it had been preening and collected a few feathers, a souvenir of eagle food. While I was sitting in the car boot opening, changing into my shoes, I looked up and there was Goldie again, quartering the ground I had just crossed. Her holding attitude, tail spread and wings held kestrel-like, suggested that she was hunting. 
She wheeled off and glided briefly to the right, then turned into the wind to resume the hovering attitude. This she kept repeating with a few vigorous flaps of her powerful wings to steady herself in the hovering posture. To the naked eye, she appeared as a tiny point in the sky. Some cloud had swept in, domesticating the halcyon blue to more familiar Irish conditions. These were her skies now. She belonged there. I blessed her as I left. Um, <clears throat> just one other thing that I would add to, uh, to the book if I were revising it or writing such a book nowadays is I would uh, add a note on Westport. The, the motto of Westport Town, you might be aware, is Aquile in Umbra. Translated, that's in the shadow of the eagle. And uh, I just mention it here because it's actually a reference to uh, Crow Patrick, which in some, old, some of the old maps is referred to as Mount Eagle from an old name, Mons Egli. And it's, it's actually a, a misprision. Wh who, whoever or whatever Egli was, it wasn't an eagle, but it gets translated or mistranslated as Mount Eagle, which then becomes one of the titles of Lord Altamont. He was um, Baron Mount Eagle. And thus the, the motto of Westport Town, but it's, it's kind of a heraldic eagle, not, not a reference to birds in the wild. Okay, <clears throat> so if, if I could move on then, if I have a, a bit of time. Ten minutes, thank you. Um, I'd like to just refer to a book I published fairly, fairly soon after Eagle Country. You might say I got into my stride and I wanted to focus more, more closely on the, the Wild Nathan area in Mayo, which has been, I suppose, the focus of some debate over recent years because of, in the context of rewilding and debates about what actually is rewilding, what constitutes rewilding, and how should rewilding um, be actually managed. And that is uh, a map, a slightly idiosyncratic map of the area I'm talking about. It comprises the, the National Park, but it's, it's a bigger area. It stretches out to the east as far as Nathan, overlooking Loch Conn. And it stretches to the west, right down to uh, Mulrani, under Claggan Mountain. And then you have a, a sweep going all the way up north as far as um, Korshleve. So it, it's Wild Nathan, in, in my account, is a, a, bigger, a bigger area, a bigger territory uh, than the, the, na the National Park itself. Now, the Eagle, Eagle Country was mainly about summer excursions. And then, in the case of Wild Nathan, I was interested in giving an account of this area during the winter. Um, maybe it was just a little bit of a counter gesture to tourism, which is usually about the, the, the fine months, the summer months. So I was interested to see what, what interest, what, were the, what was the flavour, what was the, the quality of the place during uh, the winter. And there's a photograph of a river catchment up in the northwestern part of the area called Tarsicon Moor. It's a tributary of the Owen Duff River, not too far from uh, Bangor. And in fact, the Bangor Trail crosses this river. Um, I was probably in, in that picture. And this is a photograph taken from the side of uh, Korshleve. And I've mentioned the people I met on my travels. And when I first started exploring around um, Tarsahan, I met a man called uh, Paddy McHugh. There he is dancing with his daughter, Mary. And he was 
the late Paddy McHugh, was a man from another era. There's always this sense when you go out to the country and meet people that they're kind of the last of the line. Um, I suppose we're all the last of the line. <laughs> we're all the last of some line, in, 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 a, in a sense. But he told me quite, quite matter-of-factly uh, that there was a giant who lived on the top of uh, Corsley one time. This wasn't a big deal for him. It was just something that he would uh, say, just as we might say, oh, look, there's a, a dolmen over there, or there's a cranog. Out, out on the bog. And of course, when you start exploring, you, you make connections. And here's the cairn on top of uh, Korslev called Lachta Dahibon, Dahibon's uh, cairn. And a little bit later, then, when uh, old Paddy was, um, was declining. I met his son, Podge, and I met... Podge and I went out onto the Bangor Trail and took a look at the larger catchment next to the Tarsahan, that's the, um, the Owen Duff catchment. And for anyone interested in conservation, the name, you know, Owen Duff Nathan was part of a famous uh, dispute between Ireland and European Union some years ago over protecting um, wild birds, things like uh, white-fronted geese and merlin and golden plover and so on in, in that area. Okay. Let me just skip on quickly, and I'd like to have the opportunity to read one more extract from, from the book. So just moving quickly through the remaining slides, um, we're, we're talking, as we, as we talk about the wild landscape, we're also talking about policies and people and um, attitudes, and, aren't we? So we're talking about our history in, in so many instances. And as you look at the, the area of the National Park and the area to the west of the mountains, you come up against... Um, the story of, of Rock House and its sporting estate. There it is on the, marked out on a relatively modern map. And there is a, a portion of it uh, from an older map. I'll just go back to the previous slide. We're familiar with the story of the big estates being broken up and parceled out and sold to the tenants. And that has all sorts of implications for how land can be managed. Sometimes we'd like, we kind of think, oh, if only we had the big estates in Scotland, you know, we could deal with 10,000 acres at a stretch and that gives us great opportunities. Sometimes we look with a little bit of envy at, at Scotland. Now, by a curious anomaly in, up here in Rock House, whereas the land was divided, the sporting rights were retained over the original estate of 32,000 acres. So shooting rights and um, much of the fishing rights are still intact. That is a rock house today. You might call it a, a small big house. Uh, it was owned by the Clives and is still managed to this day as a, as a sporting estate. It, the activity there is, is fairly low-key. It doesn't involve lots of vehicles and lots of people and so on. It's, it's about buying a ticket to fish the river for, a, for an afternoon or maybe to go out, um, to go out uh, flying falcons or something like that. So it's, um, you know, it, it's fairly low-key. Low and the experience of be joining the falconers in this area one afternoon was, was quite... Uh, quite a novelty for me. Okay, but I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of um, a bridge now and uh, just evoke one more area in the Wild Nathan area, which for me, if if you're looking for um, what we might call the older, more mysterious and more marvelous aspects of landscape aspects of landscape that have to do with 
elements in folklore and superstition, then I would say that the area near a place called Derry Brock uh, is, pretty, um, is pretty interesting. I'm going to skip one slide. Um, there is a view of Derry Brock looking towards Mount Eagle. And similar to a uh, Porrick slide of the Wicklow Uplands, the name Derry Brock, Dirre Brock, the Badger Wood. Right, you don't see many trees there now, do you? Although there are a few. In one little um, hollow, there are some old hawthorns. And there is a, a place marked on Barry Dalby's map called Crown She, Fairy Tree. And it is the, the one place where I have found a certain concentration of, call it what you will, superstition, um, association. Um, and on my travels, you see the distinctive uh, signature of the photographer there again on the, on the left. I came across uh, these stones just on the shore of a lake. And maybe I'll, I'll just finish with a little extract from Wild Nathan uh, referring to, uh, to this area and to these things I found. Just to explain, I'd been there a couple of times. Um, on the first occasion, I'd lost my wife. She sort of disappeared, and that spooked me. It honestly did. I found her again, I'll hate to add. Um, the second one, I saw a fox very close up. I had a, a low sun, the glare of the sun behind me, so the fox had no idea that I was in the middle of the glare. He came very close. And then on the third occasion, something, something a bit different happened. So if you allow me just a couple of minutes to conclude with this extract from, from the book. This time, I approached the lake reverentially, crossing a flat expanse of deer sedge and mat grass descending into a boggy hollow just south of it. A few thin ribbons of aquatic weed were spread across the surface, and other plant stalks with flosses of algae receded into the tea-coloured depths. An abandoned water tank sitting in a couple of feet of water at the northern end held my attention, but as I marched towards it, I spotted a cluster of quartz stones set on the grassy top of a peat bank at the water's edge. The largest stone was as big as a cow's head, the smallest fist-sized. They were sunk in the grassy sward and had not been shifted for years. I had seen such clusters before on the Bangor Trail, wayside cairns marking a spot where someone had died, and I thought that these stones marked a death perhaps a drowning or suicide, at this secluded lake. Others will say that this is the site of a killeen, or children's burial place. This thought took the mystery away from the putative association with fairies and gave the place a different secular sense as a spot where a life had ended and where others had put quartz stones on a bank as a memorial. While I believed I knew why children were warned to stay away from this place, when I sat down nearby, taking a reflective break, a gust of wind through rushes made me start, as though I were still prone to superstitious visitations. The outflow from the lake ran through a swamp of sphagnum and rushes into a smaller pond, tennis court size, with a fading crop of water lilies. The flowering stalks sticking out of the water were spent at the ends like extinguished matches. This pond in turn delivered water into a little stream among rushes that cut a channel into the drift and spread out into the damp flush where I had met my fox. Four mallard took off from this wet ground when I appeared and turned overhead, a smart squadron in fly past. The squashy glen with its relict fairy thorns sits in an armchair of bluffs and hillocks formed by glacial drift. The highest point overlooking the trees is known as Knuck Nishi, or Paul Hill. Paul, or Paul, is a nearby depression, which has again been promoted to the height, giving the oxymoronic name. 
Nosing round the top, I heard a few distant notes from a refugee curlew. There were old trenches where the peat layer had been cut out for fuel, and in the grassy areas, dense punctuations of psilocybin mushrooms. These magic hallucinogens could be the occasion for another mode of derangement or haunting. Having established so many paths to bewilderment in my own mind, I looked with a secular eye at the hawthorns, a stand of very old trees rotting away under a hoar burden of lichens with a whitewash of schizopora fungus on the main branches. Two old hoodie nests were visible in the tops, one holding a flourish of weedy growth like a hanging basket. Unplugged from old associations, the hawthorns stand as survivors in a landscape sheep-wrecked, to use George Monbiot's phrase. Before I came off the ridge, I heard shouts from the lower track and saw a sheepman's dog run into the narrow glen below me, heading for a small flock of sheep in the hollow. The man then appeared for a moment on the ridge line close to me and shouted again at the dog, calling it back. The dog returned to its owner and they both went back down the track. Neither of them had any inkling that I was present, looking down on them. One's own unobserved presence on a hillside has something weird about it, something unheimlich in these contested territories of the Western uplands. This informs my own sense that you can never trust your solitude in what passes for wilderness, and you should always assume that the hills are watching. Thank you very much.